Okay, it's being recorded. Okay, hello and welcome everyone to the fourth London Climate Action Week talk that Hannah Smith and Full Limb Council are hosting. Today's talk will be focused on biodiversity, which is both impacted by and impacts climate change. So just to go through some housekeeping, please make sure that you're muted while our speakers are talking. You're more than welcome to write questions and comments at any point in the chat, and we'll address these in the Q&A at the end of the session. So today we've got four very exciting talks. Um, firstly, we'll hear from council officers who will introduce the topic and then tell us what the council is doing. Um, we'll then learn what the community is doing and how you can get involved. Um, and these are from our speakers, Lucy, who is head gardener at Fulham Palace, and Katie, who is from the Hammersmith Community Garden Association. Um, but before we get into this, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce councillor Anne Rosenberg. Thank you for inviting me to open this trailblazing meeting as part of London Climate Action Week. In 1789, Benjamin Franklin wrote these words about his city, Philadelphia, in America. By covering the ground with buildings and pavements which carry off most of the rain and prevent it soaking into the earth and restoring and purifying the springs and the water of wells, must gradually grow up over time to be unfit for use and I found this happened in all old cities. When he wrote this over 200 years ago, many of Philadelphia's streams which ran into the Schuylkill and Del Delaware rivers were cesspools of household and industrial waste. These health hazards were eventually covered with brick arches and became sewers, which were then covered by new streets and an expanding impervious landscape, which meant that the rain had fewer places to soak into the earth. This solution was copied time and time again by all major world cities, including London, which faced the same pollution problems as Philadelphia. The Thames was increasingly contaminated with sewage. I was a member of a campaign group who argued against this multi-million pound rain drain, where clean rainwater was mixed with sewage, the so-called super sewer. Harvesting rainwater, an increasingly precious resource, transformed Philadelphia from a grimy rundown city into a green oasis by creating rain gardens and green spaces for trees so that the stormwater soaked into the earth. The unexpected cost benefit to the city was cleaner air, the mitigation of the city heat island effect in summer, a reduction in crime, the strengthening of neighborhood communities and increased property value. Within a decade, Philadelphia became the textbook city for other world cities with similar sewage problems and adopt sustainable urban drainage or SUDS as it is known. It is, in now, it is now enjoying the success of this ongoing 30 year project to create a sustainable urban environment. I mention this because I recently became aware that there were changes taking place in Hammersmith and Fulham. It began some years back when the council stopped using glyphosate to kill street weeds. Then I noticed a local residential road was resurfaced with permeable asphalt. In the street where I lived, the paving round street trees was replaced with a permeable material and grass verges became rain gardens. And the recent No Mow May raised awareness of the benefits of working with nature. Hammersmith and Fulham is one of the first urban boroughs to embrace the value of suds as part of their flood risk assessment. It is now routine that they use 96% weak link permeable material for road surfacing repairs. Ecology was the new word which entered the council vocabulary. I discovered that the council has appointed an ecologist and a department to develop a green infrastructure in a city which is battling air pollution as more and more vehicles are on the road. The impact of climate change is a major factor and the urban environment benefits from trees which mitigate the heat island effect in summer and break up icy winters, winds in winter. Hammersmith and, Council, Hammersmith and Fulham Council is leading the way in building a green city by increasing permeable surfaces to harvest rainwater. This holistic approach with green verges, rain gardens and tree planting make for a healthier clean air environment. Homeowners are encouraged not to use impervious paving in their front gardens and replace garden decking with grass and encourage the nature to become part of their lives. Hammersmith and Fulham is committed to tackling the climate and ecological emergency. 
I'll now hand over to Seb again um, for an introduction on the topic. Back to me, yeah, this is, uh, has this been good for me so far. Uh, hello everyone, uh, I, I'm Seb Dunnett. Uh, I'm the Ecology Officer in the Climate Unit. Um, thank you so much to Councillor Rosenberg for, for going through the, the process of videoing and, and writing that speech um, for the session. Uh, she actually recently told me that her garden is uh, so wild that she uh, struggles to uh, get into it sometimes. So she's definitely doing her bit for ecology in the borough. Um, I like to shoehorn in ecological anecdotes anytime I talk. So uh, my one for today was uh, I've been watching a, a flock of juvenile starlings outside my window all morning. Uh, so it's good to see that they at least they've had quite a good year. Um, I'm going to provide a very, very brief introduction because I know the, the meat of this event is going to be the other speakers uh, as well as a Q&A at the end. So uh, next slide, please, Simone. Uh, the climate and ecological emergencies uh, have a complicated relationship. Uh, they are distinct from each other, uh, but share many of the same drivers. They are also interlinked. Um, climate change can drive species extinctions, uh, but also deforestation is a large driver of climate change. Uh, for this reason, Hammersmith and Fulham, I was delighted to see you're one of the few councils in the UK to declare both a climate and an ecological emergency. Next slide, please, Simone. So climate change drives species loss. Um, normally, atmospheric change is so gradual that species have a chance to uh, adapt to the change by either moving their distribution northwards or um, climbing up at elevation to get to slightly colder climes. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, the speed the temperature change is happening means that some of that natural adaptation can't happen. Um, migrants are especially vulnerable. Uh, for those who were have been lucky enough to see the return of the Swifts to uh, the UK, um, unfortunately, earlier arrival times for the Swifts mean that sometime in the future they may arrive in the UK when no food is available. Next slide, please, Simone. So biodiversity loss drives climate change. Um, an extreme example of this uh, would be if we were to take uh, an old growth, old growth forest and convert it into a car park. Um, in the famous Joni Mitchell way. Um, we both release all the carbon that was locked up in those trees for hundreds of years, uh, but also remove that land's ability to draw down any future uh, carbon emissions. Uh, at the same time, as we decrease the number of species within a system, we, we decrease the uh, resilience of that system. So, for example, Hammersmith and Fulham, uh, are like a lot of London boroughs, uh, are heavily reliant street tree wise on London plane trees. Um, they make up about 14% of our uh, street trees. Uh, if some disease were to emerge that attacked just those trees, it would have a fairly similar effect. Uh, next slide, please, Simone. Uh, so nature has been providing solutions to climate change for aeons. Um, we have another event on climate adaptation tomorrow that I hope to see many of you at, uh, so I won't dwell too much on this slide. Um, only to say that in the vast majority of cases, ecological interventions and winds are climate ecological or climate interventions and winds. Um, so without further ado, I'm looking forward uh, to hearing all about the ecology work in the borough uh, and I'll hand back over to you, Simone. Thank you very much, Seb. I'm now handing over to Richard Gill to talk about what the council is doing. He's our senior parks manager. Hey, good morning um, or good afternoon even. Um, I'm gonna give a quick introduction as to what we're doing in parks. Um, thinking in particular how we respond to the Council's vision of rising to the challenge of the climate and ecological emergency. The main focus of that at the moment is for us um, enhancing biodiversity and I've uh, divided this broadly into three themes. Firstly, uh, protecting what we have. It's, it's been a strange 18 months, hasn't it, um, with COVID uh, as, as parks and park facilities were closed in response to the pandemic. But out of this crisis, I think many people have recognized the new value of parks. They need them for exercise, to socialize, just to breathe. And visitor numbers have definitely increased. Um, just, I don't have figures for it, but you know, if you go to a park during lockdown, it was as busy on a weekday as it was uh, on a normal weekend. And it's, you know, we've seen huge numbers in our parks. There's also a growing recognition that parks contribute to climate mitigation, which has been quite well covered by Seb already. They're cooler than the general urban environment. They can absorb rainfall and runoff and prevent flooding. They can absorb particulate pollution and improve air quality. And parks aren't a new idea, as we've already heard. The Victorian Ed Edwardian planners who set out many of our parks 
uh, described them as the lungs of our city, a vital space to escape for health and recreation. What is new though, I think, is that um, science is really beginning to back up this, um, how parks can help our physical and in particular, I think, our mental well-being. Improving biodiversity opportunities is about making more room for nature. Parks are set out for human benefit, but our views on how these benefits affect us have changed. Many of our parks have large areas set out for recreation, such as tennis courts and formal gardens and lawns. But some areas such as bowling greens are beginning to um, be less popular and um, so we do continually need to review and and change our parks and how we use them. Many people using parks this year, perhaps for the first time regularly, have expressed the importance of hearing birdsong, to be able to see greenery and to breathe the outside air. And managing for biodiversity helps allow for a wider range of species and experience. This should give us a more sustainable future, not depending on a single type of tree or shrub. And if we did anyway, how, how boring would that be? Uh, improving our actions, it's about understanding why people use the parks in the way they do and how we as a park service use the tools we have to protect and improve the parks. It's about how we communicate with the residents to explain what we're doing. And it's about offering opportunities to residents to get involved and help us protect and enjoy what we have. We have uh, 58 parks and cemeteries and open spaces to look after. So the slide on the left is taken from the local plan and gives you some idea of their location and relative size to the rest of the borough. And you can see in some areas, you know, we're, we're quite well off the um, open space and in some areas less so. And the slide on the left also um, uh, grades the, the spaces that we have according to nature conservation value. So each, each space, you know, might be of borough importance or, or of local importance. But just to put parks in context, the slide on the right um, shows private gardens in the borough and shows the percentage of their vegetation. Obviously these gardens haven't been evaluated for nature or biodiversity, but broadly I think you could say that the more vegetation they have, the better they are for nature. So you can see what importance private gardens have, you know, in, in nature conservation and biodiversity within the borough as a whole. So it's not just about our public open spaces, although these are the, the, the spaces um, that, that I, I'm helping to look after. The, these, I guess, are our rainforests, you know, but there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a greater uh, array of spaces out there that kind of add to the whole picture. Um, so just a, a couple of our parks here, unsurprisingly, not all our parks are the same. The picture on the left is the courtyard garden of Ravenscourt Park in summer. And the picture on the right is uh, wormwood scrubs in, in winter. Our parks do differ in size and the amount of maintenance they, that we put into them, the number of visitors, the type of activity, and of course, biodiversity opportunity. One of the criteria for a green flag is how we manage biodiversity. And most of our parks do have a management plan. This will identify how the park is used, what opportunities there are for biodiversity, and what projects we're gonna to plan to help improve this. And there's also a number of strategic projects that we've used to improve biodiversity, such as Tiny Forests and Nomo May. Tiny Forests is an initiative to plant a new area of woodland about the size of a tennis court with a mix of native species. These will be managed to become a mini woodland and have benefits for climate, biodiversity, and be used as an educational resource. No Mo May was also trialled this year. All grass in parks with the exception of sports pitches was allowed to flower, giving more opportunity for pollinators and other species. To me and many others, it has also amenity advantages. I mean, I would much rather see areas of daisies and buttercups and speedwell than, than just uh, close mown grass. Um, but there have been some learning points. It, we are finding it difficult to catch up, partly because it was such a wet May, so there was a lot of growth and it's, it's difficult to cut and collect all that grass all at once. Um, go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, improving our actions is quite a wide ranging um, area really, covering not just how we as council officers perform our duties, but also ultimately how visitors will use and engage the, with their parks and open spaces. By way of illustration, I'm gonna use the um, 
Biodiversity Commission report from 2017 on the left. Um, this identified a number of actions which we should be doing, such as encouraging volunteering, planting more native trees and hedges, creating more wild areas, using signage to explain what those wild areas are about, and facilitating outdoor education. Many of these actions were already underway in parks, but we've ensured that they'll all be picked up in the new grounds maintenance contract, which we've been busy writing. It doesn't have such an exciting cover as the uh, biodiversity report, um, <clears throat> and it's actually not got as many exciting pictures in it either, but it is a very important document for us. It's our major tool to manage our parks and green spaces, and, and the grounds maintenance contract is our major expenditure. It's due to commence early next year, and we've ensured that biodiversity will have a major theme within that. Bidders for the new contract have had to explain how they will deliver on biodiversity and other objectives that are important to us, such as community outreach, supporting friends groups, and using green vehicles. Ultimately, it will be the community engagement with parks and how people enjoy them that is the measure of our success. And just on the right, I've illustrated a few of our recent successes, including the, uh, the wildlife pond at South Park, which is managed by our friends group, uh, the planting of a tiny forest at Hammersmith Park, and the Bees for Refugees project, which aims to improve education about and the importance of bees as pollinators within our environment. Uh, there is some information about what we do on the website, um, but if you do want to get involved, then please contact us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Richard. I'd now like to introduce Lucy Hart, who is head gardener at Fulham Palace. Hello, everyone, um, and thank you very much for um, having me and um, this lunchtime. Um, we love talking about Fulham Palace, so um, I'm really pleased to be here. Sadly, I'm at home because my son is having to self-isolate from school as from today. So I'm just hoping he doesn't come in <laughs> whilst I'm giving this talk. But fortunately, of course, this is Zoom, so we can do it still. So all good. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk to you about um, how, you know, the things we're doing at Fulham Palace to increase our biodiversity. We, um, this, this May, we launched our biodiversity policy. Um, we've been working on it for a while now, and um, uh, we formally launched it at a Green Meat event, which we were able to um, get in between sort of lockdowns. We did it all with the council's um, approval. Um, but it was a great um, opportunity to talk about all the stuff we do, which we, we just kind of do and, and actually actually um, haven't really spoken much about it. So this is this is great. Um, but if you didn't know, Fulham Palace is um, the historic home of the Bishop of London. Um, we are a 13 acre site at the south of the borough and um, uh, we are open free of charge seven days a week um, and uh, I've been as head gardener for 10 years now and have been restoring it um, for all that time there's still lots more to do um, and I have 60 garden volunteers and always three garden apprentices um, as a rolling kind of um, um, a project um, and we're hoping, hoping to take on two more garden trainees so we're always kind of looking to work with new people as well as um, we're starting to um, work with young people um, who haven't had um, much gardening experience um, perhaps you know in their lives so we're hoping to offer them some new opportunities. Um, but um, part of our policy is initially to look at what um, biodiversity we have at Fulham Palace. So these last few months, we've um, uh, commissioned a, an expert who's been doing bird surveys, Lepidoptera surveys. Lepidoptera are butterfly and moth um, species and insect surveys. And so um, we're really excited about that. Looking forward to hearing the results. We know to date that um, from the overnight moth uh, trapping that he did in the wool garden. Um, we did find the clear wing moth, which is really exciting. And also um, we found um, a huge uh, population of um, peacock butterfly larvae in our nettles. Um, and so, you know, things are really happening, um, but um, it'll be really good to get this, this um, these figures as to what we've got so we know when we continue our work, whether we're improving it, which we should hopefully be doing. Uh, so next slide, please, Simone. Simone. 
Um, so as you can see, um, uh, long grass has, has been mentioned, um, is, is very important to us. And this side on the left is our moat, um, which I've been managing, you know, since I've been here to really constantly cut it down in September, remove the vegetation, allowing natural species in. And we had this surveyed last year and we've got some quite interesting species. We've got one of the best populations um, uh, apparently in north in north of the river um, of the Bascom nigrum. Um, and there is an interesting mint species growing in there now. And these are all things that have sort of found their own way in just from the management that we've been doing, letting it grow long, cutting it down um, once a year. Um, the other slides just show by leaving some of our lawns, oh sorry, on the, on the other one, leaving some of our lawns um, long, we're able to bring in food for pollinators. We've got some great Achillea um, yarrow in our lawns, which is very um, drought resistant. So it's good for summer green lawns, um, also providing food with their flowers. Next slide, please. Um, and then we've enhanced some of our long uh, grass areas by planting um, wildflower plugs that we've sown ourselves. We've got some volunteers here on the left doing that. And also I sow each year, I always try and sow some yellow rattle seed, which is a hemiparasitic plant, which uh, reduces the vigor of grasses um, and it was, uh, sort of allows other species to come in eventually. So in our apple orchard, we have a really lovely um, population of that growing that there now. And you can see where it is, the grass, this vigorous grass, which isn't very good um, you know, for diversity. It really reduces the grass and allows other things in. Next slide, please. Um, also, when we think about planting, um, uh, it's always about trying to ex um, extend the flowering season up here at Fulham Palace. So we're offering food for pollinators as early as we can and ideally 12 months of the year. So as part of our um, phase three project, we did a community bulb plant um, and this is what it looks like in spring now. And I chose some of the species, uh, the cultivars, daffodils, particularly because they were good for pollinators. Um, and so that kind of kickstarts a, a big mass load of food for, for them back at that end of the, of the site, um, just between the wall garden and the church yard. Next slide, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and we have our own woodland, um, small woodland at that, but it's, it, 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 you know, it's, it's lovely. So we do woodland management on a small scale. We coppice our hazel and that opens up areas to allow new species in, um, but also we can use the, the uh, brushwood to support and stake our plants in our herbaceous borders. So it's all very sustainable. Next slide. Um, I look, we look after our trees here on site. Um, we do have a lot of trees for such a small site. Um, and there was um, some instances where I had to sadly remove some of the sycamore, which were uh, overtaking everything else and kind of creating this kind of monoculture. We want diversity. We wanted to plant other species. So we replaced all the, the, the trees that we cut down, we replaced with new plantings. But I used the, um, the trunks there to make a natural play area. So the logs weren't taken off site. They were just moved into position. And now that's a really nice place for children to come and play or, and local muni communities to meet. Next slide. Um, so we have our wall garden and we grow our veg and um, I use companion planting. Uh, lots of that goes on because we don't use any sprays. So there's lots of tricks like marigolds you can see and with the carrots to confuse all the pests um, and just to try and get some healthy crops. Next slide, please. Um, and all that produce um, goes and we sell it on our barrow. So um, people are buying freshly harvested produce that have just come literally from the garden just opposite the barrow itself so um it's a, a really nice way to, um you know uh, service to offer the public it, it's actually a vital part of our income being free entry so um but certainly um it's organically grown um and we are supplying in our cafe this from from this year as well next slide please so organic techniques are used, as I said, we use biological controls, we don't use any sprays, so we use predatory mites and wasps to, um, to ward off all the insects and we use netting to stop butterflies, the cabbage white, for example, going into the brassicas, as you can see in that slide on the lower. Uh, next slide, please. And here's our orchard. I always get asked what these little bags are on the left. They are live lacewing larvae that I buy in and they 
they arrive, they hunt out aphids immediately, they crawl out and they predate them. So again, no need to spray. Next slide, please. Um, and we use peat free compost only at Fulham Palace. So all the plants that we grow to sell are all with peat free. Um, and of course, as uh, you know, the first thing I did when I got here was to put to set up a new compost system because that is uh, so important to be able to get rid of your garden waste sustainably, plus then create the mulch and the compost that you need to put it back out. It's a win win situation there. Next slide, please. So just to round it up, um, you know, we're doing lots of things. We're, we're launching, we've launched our policy. The next thing is to get together a, um, we'd like to get a expert panel, um, which will be the next thing for us to, to invite people, experts to come um, and join together and help to advise us at Fulham Palace to see what we can be doing more of. Um, but other things we, you know, we know we would like to use, utilize our, um, the, uh, the palace itself, the roofs and have more water butts around. Um, and I'm always looking at electrical uh, battery operated machinery rather than um, uh, fuel, um, fuel driven. Um, and also we'd like to have more water habitats. It's, it's tricky because we're very limited on how deep we can dig at Fulham Palace, but it, it's something we're very much considering. So thank you very much for listening and um, uh, I look forward to hearing the other talks. Great, thank you so much, Lucy. I might butt in with a quick question and ask if um, anyone's interested in volunteering, can they just contact you via email? That's great. Yeah, I'm afraid we're full at the moment, but um, you, if people are interested, then please look at the website on um, on our website, filmpalace.org. Go to the Get Involved pages, and if the garden um, volunteer role is up, then we will have places um, available. Um, at the moment, we are full, but uh, just keep looking and keep coming in and asking us as well. It's always good to have a chat face to face. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Lucy. Um, I'll now hand over to Katie from the Hammersmith Community Garden Association. Um, hi, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about uh, Hammersmith Community Gardens, first of all, um, what we do, and then um, talk a little bit about uh, what you can do in your own home regarding gardening. Um, so uh, we're a small uh, charity uh, based around Hammersmith. Here you can see some pictures of some of the um, community events we do and some of the work we do with schools. We work in about 13 schools each week, um, delivering environmental education. Um, we have volunteer projects uh, on our community gardens, but we also do a lot of work in the community um, running um, various different growing projects uh, locally. Um, next slide, please. And uh, this is a little bit about how we got started. So um, top left is um, Loris and Godolphin Gardens that we have are two very small gardens in sort of Shepherd's Bush, Hammersmith, and they were both bomb sites. Um, and I believe that is Loris Gardens is a bomb site. And uh, then the um, local residents started using the land informally as gardens, as you can see in the middle picture. Uh, but then in the 80s, the council wanted to sell the land and the residents fought that and won and formed Hammersmith Community Gardens. Um, so towards the bottom, you can see what Loris and Godolphin Gardens look like today. Um, and then Hammersmith Community Gardens also has Phoenix Farm in White City, which is nearly an acre of um, veg and fruit and uh, lots of plants for wildlife and medicinal herbs. Uh, and we've also got bees and some small animals and um, chickens there. Um, and then we also have the glass houses in Ravenscourt Park. And so what we do on our sites, uh, Phoenix and um, at Ravenscourt Park, they really display uh, educational sites where um, we try and grow as many different uh, varieties of fruit and veg as you can. We have volunteers that maintain the sites. Then we have various different um, groups. So at, at Phoenix, we have after school clubs. We've got a toddler group um, on a Wednesday morning. Um, at Raven's Court, we've got a new session, which is for uh, people that have struggled during lockdown with mental, physical well-being. So that's pretty much everyone's invited to that. Um, and it's a mixture of gardening and some well-being activities as well. Um, and, and so we, I always say that we're kind of half wildlife and half veg 
because we we do quite a lot of um, projects in Hammersmith and Fulham and in Westminster and Kensington, Ch Kensington and Chelsea to try and green the borough and make it more friendly for wildlife. Uh, but then a lot of what we do on our sites is um, sort of food education and gardening, uh, a lot of growing and uh, cooking. Um, next slide, please. Um, so some of the ideas of things that you can do at home and, and that we do in our gardens. Um, this uh, we do quite a lot of planting uh, for wildlife. Um, and uh, on the left hand side is a uh, roof garden that we planted up for a company in Hammersmith um, who wanted to um, plant for uh, bees and butterflies and other wildlife. Um, and the other two pictures are where we're maintaining some of the sustainable urban drainage sites that the councils have, uh, the councils put in. Um, next slide. Um, uh, here's some examples of what you can do in a really small space. So this is somebody um, that volunteers with us. This is what they've done on their balcony last year, actually. This was in lockdown. Um, so lots of um, growing in pots. There's lots of different varieties that you can get that uh, are happy in pots. Um, so some of the soft fruit and um, beans and tomatoes, you can get varieties that are, that are happy outdoors and happy in pots. So you don't need to have a greenhouse. Um, you can start things off on your windowsill and then move them out to whatever small space you've got. Um, next slide, please. Um, so here's some more, uh, some, somebody's very busy uh, windowsill with lots of uh, starting off some plants that will go outside, but also um, things like uh, chilies which, and herbs that are quite happy um, on a windowsill. Um, and growing your own food is sort of a win-win, so it removes the, um, the food miles that are involved and the carbon that's involved in uh, transportation of food. Um, obviously, the more plants we can have, the, the more carbon dioxide that's absorbed, so, so that's also um, a good thing. And then also to do with air quality, um, and um, there are some... Uh, scientific papers that will say about how much better your air quality will be if you have um, houseplants. Um, so yeah, try and get get some houseplants in your rooms, uh, and um, uh, that will that will help your air quality. Um, and um, this is next slide's about making some space for nature. So similar, we did no mow may in our gardens. Um, and uh, similarly, just don't be afraid to leave a little bit of space wild if you have got a garden or a front garden or let some weeds grow because, you know, the dandelions and daisies and buttercups and clover and all those things that we think of as weeds um, are actually really vital. And um, a couple of years ago, I went to a, uh, a whole day talk at um, Zoological Society of London about biodiversity and they were saying how cities are actually much more by, or can be more biodiverse than the countryside because everybody's got these pockets of um, of flowers and, and different habitats. Whereas uh, in some areas in the countryside you have sort of monocultures. So there's not there's actually can be many more varieties of insects uh, in the cities. So please um, keep some little areas free uh, for wildlife. Keep it messy. It's perhaps a good excuse. I don't know. Next slide. Um, so I want to just mention a couple of sort of green infrastructure ideas. So this is a green roof system. Um, so we have green roofs on some of our sheds and I know that um, there's quite a lot of buildings in London that have been having them. So this is sedum. So it doesn't really require any maintenance because it's happy if it's wet and it's happy if it's dry. Um, and in this example, it's actually just on a normal felted roof and you can buy these square pods. They're about um, 50 pounds a square meter and they literally just sit on top of your felt roof and the sedum kind of spreads in between uh, the gaps so you can't see over time that, that they are just squares. And there's a little bit of, um, a couple of inches of substrate underneath. So it's a mix, it's kind of a light um, sort of gravel, uh, very low maintenance. Um, just, you could add a little uh, bit of fertilizer in the spring. You can buy a box of um, fish blood and bone meal. Uh, and um, sprinkle it over. So very, very low maintenance. And um, having the green roof, um, as well as obviously being a lovely habitat for wildlife, actually uh, can do 
uh, has a quite a lot of other benefits. So it's insulating and it reduces the noise in your property. Um, also, it looks very nice. Um, but also having um, uh, plants on your building like this, um, they it can actually cool down the temperature of the building because um, in cities, the or the concrete and um, the road surfacing absorbs the heat uh, and actually um, stores that heat. And so the more plants that we can have uh, on green roofs and growing up the side of buildings actually means that the, um, the heat isn't being absorbed by the building and the plants cool down the air with the evapotranspiration. Um, so the green roof has many benefits in terms of energy use and noise as well as obviously providing a nice habitat. Um, next slide. Oh sorry one minute, there we go. All right. um, so composting, that's a really tricky question in London and, and um, we get a lot of uh, questions about composting um, because it's very hard if you don't have a garden to, not necessarily to compost because you can get small composting units for for balconies, but it's hard to then, um, you know, do something with the compost that you have. Um, and unfortunately, as an, we're not allowed to take compost or food waste as an organisation um, due to uh, the risk of contamination. Um, and but if you do have space and you can compost, um, you can you can get very small composting units. You can get fast hot composting units, or you can just build some out of pallets. Um, I, I in my garden have some pallets that are literally just put together with cable ties, not very sophisticated, not as nice as these lovely ones that our volunteers built in Ravenscourt Park glass houses, um, but they work fine. I just shove everything in there and, and a year later it's all lovely compost. Um, I wanted to mention the peat as well, which has come up. Um, it's Peat is a, a carbon sink uh, and then it's such a fantastic medium for growing that that's why it's been used in garden centres and sold in garden centres for, for so many years. But in order to access the peat, the land is drained, the vegetation is taken away, and then the peat is, um, uh, it sort of reacts, it oxidises when it, when it hits the air and releases all the carbon dioxide. And the statistic for something like a meter of peat is actually 100 years worth of stored carbon dioxide. Um, so garden centres have got a little bit better now and selling more peat free compost. Um, what they're not all doing is when they when you buy a plant that's already in a pot in a compost, that's often not peat free. Um, so if you if you if, if you don't feel like there's much you can do because you haven't got space, then campaigning for things like this is just really helpful because the less uh, the less demand there is from consumers from peat, then then the better um, that will be. And so at Hammersmith Community Gardens, we obviously have our own compost, but we buy peat free uh, compost for seedlings as well. Next slide. Um, I've sort of touched on this already. Um, if you can grow any plants up your buildings, um, that's really good for uh, yeah the cooling um, and obviously air quality and um, also plants then slow down the, the water going into the drainage system. Um, and uh, if you grow the plant on the west side of the building, that is where you will get the most cooling in the house. Um, so if you if you have got your own property or you're renting and you're allowed, if you could um, stick a clematis in or something on the west side, then you hopefully will find um, as as well as your air quality improving that um, your building might be a little bit cooler. Um, and now contact details are there. We do have volunteering opportunities um, in Westminster and in Hampstead and Fulham. Um, so please, you can email info at hcga.org.uk and um, yeah, get in touch with us and, and do some volunteering. Great, thank you so much, Katie. I was just about to ask if there were volunteering opportunities, so thank you for that. Um, we now have an opportunity for uh, a question and answer session. Um, so on the slide, you can see all our speakers in case you forgot their names. Um, I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Emily, who will be hosting the Q&A.
Yeah, thank you, Simone. And thank you to all of our speakers. So interesting to hear the amazing work that you're doing at Fulham Palace, Lucy, and, and Hammersmith Community Gardens as well. So thank you so much, um, Lucy and Katie, for coming along and speaking today. So some of the questions that are coming through in the chat, if we don't have the right colleagues on the call to answer these today, we will follow up um, by email afterwards, but we will do our best to get through all the questions that come through. So first of all, a comment, which I wonder if Richard or Seb would like to comment on, um, which was saying that h &F, um, do still use glyphosate. Um, if anyone would like to respond to that one. Um, it, we, we do still use uh, glyphosate. Um, it's very limited. Um, we only use it on really pernicious weeds, um, such as um, Japanese knotweed. Um, which is a, a real problem to try and clear by any other method, really. It, it's, it's about the only way we can um, get rid of that weed. Um, if, you, if you try and um, cut it back or dig it out, you will, you will never eradicate it. And so that we found that's probably the, the only way we can get rid of it. Um, uh, uh, so it, we, we use it, I, I, th I think I, I don't, I've got some uh, figures on how much uh, glyphosate we were using compared to how much we were use, are using now and we're down to about 2% um, from what we, we used to use down to what we now use so I think that's a, that's a huge improvement and we do you know just use it for those particular problem areas. Thanks Richard, thanks for that. We now have a few questions about green roofs and planning. Um, so I wonder if Hanesh is on the call and I could potentially put you on the spot about work that we're doing in terms of buildings, planning. So some of the questions are, can we see the council imposing green roofs and walls onto new build projects in planning? And then there's also a question, do you need planning permission to have a green roof? Hi everyone, thanks Emily. Um, yeah, good questions. I might have to defer uh, those questions to planning colleagues uh, and, and it'll be something we have to follow up after. Uh, imposing uh, things on anything is, 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 is probably never welcome by, by anyone, so that, that might be a difficult one to do. But uh, I think we have started to look at how we could um, use the planning system to uh, influence developments. Um, we've always done that, so that's something we can certainly um, look at doing for, for things like turf and uh, extensions and, and uh, things that would reduce the loss of green space. So that's about as much as I can answer. I don't know if anyone else on the call might have anything to add, but otherwise it's something we'll, we'll take away and come back on. Uh, I might jump in there if possible, Emily. Um, so the, the, the planning, uh, I'll... I'll... I agree with Nesh there that I'll have to defer to planning colleagues, but in terms of imposing um, green roofs on new developments, so the London plan uh, was recently released um, uh, 20 this year, um, and as part of it, it uh, recommends uh, what's called an urban greening factor for new developments, um, and it provides this kind of framework within which we can start to more impose on new developments than we have previously. So developments need to have a certain amount of green space in their square footage, um, green roofs is probably one of the only options for a number of developments. So I think that's that's one avenue we can use. I just want to say from a personal point of view, we did a small extension and got the green roof and it wasn't terribly expensive and it's not very scary to maintain. So I think um, they're not as uh, they're not as big a commitment as you might think that they are. That's that's what I'd say. Thanks, Katie. And thanks, Hanesh and Seb. I, again, another planning question, which may be the same answer, Hanesh. Um, planning department urgently needs a policy regarding home offices. Today, up to 50% of a garden can be taken out and replaced by a home office. Might well be true. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, something that we'll, we'll definitely have to, to get advice on from planning. No worries, thank you. And Richard, this might be one for you. Um, why is every, well, it may, it may not be parks, it may be street environmental services. Why, why is every wildflower turfed out from every crack and crevice? These species provide a vertical growing wall themselves and are highly beneficial to all kinds of invertebrates and pollinators. Um, well, I, I, I guess why it, it's, 
usually I'd suggest to protect the wall. So uh, as a plant grows in a wall, it often um, can damage the, the fabric of the wall. That's usually because the wall's not in very good condition anyway, um, but a, a lot of our walls aren't in very good condition. And so, you know, we would try and protect the wall as long as we can. Um, I, I do agree though, I saw, I saw a wonderful um, array of uh, a, a kind of um, yellow poppies and geraniums and things growing in a wall in, um, in Yorkshire recently. I took a picture, I, I was gonna share it today, but I, I, I used another slide instead. But um, so in principle, I think there's, there's, there's nothing wrong in um, you know, using, using uh, less herbicide, using less um, uh, weed clearance if, if, you know, and, and using weeds um, you know, to, to, to help increase biodiversity. One of the things we have inc included in our um, uh, specification is, is to make more use of what we've called living walls on the, on the edges of some of our parks where we perhaps have a, a chain link fence and there's all kinds of vegetation growing up that chain link fence. So rather than clearing that, we'll use that as a positive thing so, and, and try and manage it for biodiversity in that way. Thanks, Richard. Carlos, you've got your hand up. Would you would you like to come and add to that, or is this a question? Hi, uh, thank you. Yes. Um, so I'm Carlos from All Bar Wise. We're an environmental education charity uh, here in Hammersmith, and and it's it's kind of like a question, a stroke, a comment, which is basically you know we 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 have a biodiversity problem. We also have an air pollution problem, and we have the people most affected by air pollution are, are actually children. And I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I, we do a lot of work in schools and most of our school grounds, especially schools that are very near busy roads, are very bare and uh, kind of don't look so good. And they are kind of, there's a lot of potential to do like ivy walls and all sorts of things in schools to help improve biodiversity and combat air pollution. Why, why aren't we, uh, doing this more and actually also even greening classrooms with putting plants inside that improve air quality like spider plants and, and things like that. So, so we're very keen to, to do something like that actually in partnership with other people in Hammersmith and Fulham and I wonder if anybody else has any ideas or comments in, in, in yeah, about that. Thank you. I, I can do that, Emily, if you want. Yeah, thanks, Seb. Um, yeah, so it, it, it's a fantastic idea, um, Carlos, and, and it's, it's something that we've seen in a couple of schools in the borough. Um, I remember speaking to one resident who put it up in his, uh, his children's school and they saw reductions in air pollution. Um, it's a difficult one, though, um, and it needs uh, quite thoughtful planning because a lot of the time, uh, the actual reduction in the air pollution that you want to reduce is quite difficult to get with the level of vegetation that you can get on the side of a road. So, I mean, there was a Royal Horticultural Society study recently that said, you know, the, the width of a hedge you'd need to get that kind of reduction in the air pollution is, I think it was one and a half to two meters. So we're talking quite a big investment in vegetation beside roads. Uh, so uh, I'm in discussion with some people at Imperial as to having some kind of physical barrier along with vegetation that can decrease the air pollution, like you say. Um, as far as having plants in classrooms, I mean, you know, if it were up to me, uh, we'd, ha we'd have classrooms outside, but you know, that's, that's <laughs> one for later. Thank you. Thanks, Carlos. Thanks, Seb. Um, we're probably gonna do five more minutes of questions and then we'll wrap up. So Seb, this might be another one for you. Can we find more space to enhance our biodiversity than just protecting our parks? For example, if we provide more low, low carbon public transport, then we can reduce the number of cars and kind of move some of that space from parking into new space for nature. Um, the short answer, yes, um, absolutely. The lot, you know, I couldn't agree more with you, Paul. Um, the, the longer answer, um, as you probably heard yesterday, because I, I noticed you were at, at a session as well, um, is that it takes movements in other places. So uh, it's quite a good setup for the, the role of our team that Hinesh, um, that leads. Uh, we're kind of cross-cutting in the council. Um, so whilst I'm, I'm a kind of traditional ecologist in the sense that I do a lot of the, the work that a traditional ecologist would do, I also sit within the climate ec uh, and eco ecological emergency team that deals quite a lot with all of these um, service lines that are putting in these measures that we can seek to take advantage of. Um, so, you know, we already have a couple of parklets within Hampton Fulham. I would love to put in more. Um, 
And I think just having this team at the council allows that question to be asked every time there is an opportunity. Thanks, Sam. Karen, is, is that a question or is that a response to? Uh, it, it was a, a different comment that I just wanted to um, make people aware of. And I thought suddenly thought this would be a good audience mm -hmm. of well-intentioned people, if you'd let me. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, we've got a project called the Great West Hedge to green the A4, which runs between Hammersmith and Hounslow. So from Chiswick Roundabout to um, Hammersmith Flyover, which Seb knows about and has sat in at some meetings. And um, we've been banging on about it for a little while and we suddenly got permission from TfL, which did feel rather like leaning on a locked door and suddenly falling through it. Um, what we don't have is the money. So um, we are now working on that, working on our planting plans and trying to work out how to get the money. Uh, so if anyone's got about 250,000, then um, I can give you our bank details. And otherwise, please support it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Karen, for that. We'll just, uh, I know that there's lots of questions coming through. Some of them are being answered in the chat. So if we don't have time to get to everything today, we will follow up by email as well. Um, a couple of other questions about planning and this time fake grass or astroturf. So again, Hanesh Seb, if you want to comment quite quickly, can we be the first council to ban fake grass in domestic settings or can we require planning commission if you intend to cover gardens with fake grass? Um, Seb, I don't know if you want to um, add anything to, to that. My um, Immediate thoughts are: I, d I don't know where the planning permission within, you know, national regulations would would cover that. So I don't know if we can be the first council to do that. I'd like to be the first council to do that if we're allowed. So it's something we'll we'll look at. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think the same same comment, um, but also within our current uh, local plan and uh, planning guidance, um, there are. Uh, mentions of discouraging people putting in artificial grass and um, built environments in their gardens. So, you know, that it's it becomes more about enforcement and how far you go with that. So I agree with Nesh in the sense that, yeah, we, we, we want to push it as far as possible. Thank you. Um, Richard, just n not a question, more a comment and something I guess we can note, but some suggestions for the ground maintenance contract discouraging or banning the use of leaf blowers, which are used to excess on flower beds um, and soil, which may blow away topsoil and associated beasties, fungi, etc. cetera. Um. Uh, yeah, that's, that's something we can take on board. I mean, w one of the things we're, we're trying to look at is, you know, do, do we need to clear the leaves from some areas? You know, we can perhaps just let the leaves um, lay where they are and they, you know they will they will become they will mulch down and help improve the soil anyway so um, you know we we do need to be more efficient in the way we uh, manage our parks and that that, that might be a, a, a good way thing we can look at. Thanks Richard and finally a couple of comments for Lucy and for Katie so the Fulham, pa the Fulham Palace Gardens are wildly wonderful and very impressed with your approach there um, that your wealth of, of knowledge is obvious um, and is key for managing green spaces elsewhere. And uh, a shout out to um, Hammersmith Community Gardens Association who are doing a fantastic job um, in helping the local community be active. Thank so maybe one, one final question each for Lucy and Katie is, you know, there, there was so much that was covered in today's presentations about, you know, what you're doing, how people can get started at home. Is there anywhere that you would recommend that people go, anything they read or watch or anywhere that they can go for more information if they're interested in enhancing biodiversity at home? Well, um, I mean, I, I watch Gardeners World <laughs> every Friday, sadly. No, it's, it's brilliant. And, uh, you know, of course, Monty Don has been, you know, sort of a pioneer of organic growing and um, peat free and keeping, um, you know, putting uh, the uh, the biodiversity at the forefront of gardening as well as creating beautiful gardens so um is you know that it simply do that you know it's really good to just i think everyone's talking about it at the moment but you can get some really good advice from from that and country file actually thanks lucy katie anything you want to add to that um yeah um, i think the rhs website is pretty good uh and also just uh have a look at hamster community gardens website and have a look at the stuff we do because we do quite a few like one-off workshops or short courses or that kind of thing 
um, and and open days, so you can drop in and just chat to staff. And um, yeah, and my other thing would just be to sort of think big if you are doing any um, work at your home. You know, try and see if you can incorporate any more green into it, and um, yeah, reduce the amount of pavement you've got with planters and and things like that. That's great. Thanks, Lucy and Katie. Um, I know there's more questions, so we will follow up at the end of this whole week um, with responses to all of your questions. So I think back to Simone to wrap up. Great. Thank you so much, Emily. And thank you to all of our speakers and to all of you, our attendees. Um, just before you leave this chat, there's a few opportunities I'd like to make you aware of. So first of all, we've just launched our climate community map. Um, this shows some of the great things that are happening across our borough. So the link to this is just being added in the chat now if you'd like to see this. And you can also tell us what's missing if you know of any biodiversity hotspots or low carbon buildings or so on. Um, next, we've also just launched our Climate Connects newsletter. So this is a monthly newsletter detailing climate news in our borough. It's got both council news and things that are happening in our community. Once again, the link to sign up to this is being added in the chat. So you can follow that and just add your email address there and you'll get this once a month. Um, and finally, we've got two more talks happening. Um, the first one is tomorrow at 12. It's adapting to climate change in Hammersmith and Fulham. Um, the link to this will be added in the chat as well. And we've also got another event which isn't technically happening during London Climate Action Week. It's going to be next Tuesday, um, but please do sign up to that as well. And that is all. So if you'd like to get in contact, our email is on screen now. So please do give us um, a shout. And that'll be all. So thank you all for coming. And I hope you have a wonderful day.